So we're here at uh, Linaho Connect. And uh, so what do you do with Linaho? A uh, number of things. I'm uh, IBM's representative to the Technical Steering Committee. I'm also a member of the Office of CTO team, which looks at forward-looking types of technologies. The one I'm focused on right now is the big dot little MP. Uh, this is uh, an architecture arm is introduced. The idea is you can think of it as voltage frequency scaling taken to another extreme. Uh, normally you have a set of transistors and you decrease the voltage and decrease the frequency and decrease the power consumption, also decrease the performance. But if you have a workload that doesn't need high performance, that's a good approach to, to use it for. But there's a limit. If you have a high performance processor, it's going to have a lot of out-of-order pipeline, it's going to have huge caches, it's going to have a lot of different functional units, and you know you've got a lot of transistors there, you can only scale that down so far. It's going to be a, there's going to be an amount of power it's going to consume no matter what. So what ARM's big dot little situation does is it takes that to another level by actually providing two sets of transistors. One set of transistors is uh, actually, as I as mentioned before, large caches, out-of-order pipeline, multiple functional units, high performance, high energy consumption. And you can take and you can decrease the voltage, decrease the frequency, but you get to a point where the energy level just does not, the power consumption does not go beyond a certain point. At that point, what you can do is you can switch to another set of transistors, same ISA, same instruction set, same instructions, but it has a much shallower pipeline, it has fewer functional units, smaller cache, and, or could have smaller cache, therefore lower performance, but lower power consumption. You can take and move the tasks, and there's a couple ways of doing that. But you take and you move the processing from the large set of transistors to the small set of transistors, and continue decreasing voltage frequency, and that allows you to get a much larger dynamic range of the power consumption of the, and also of performance. This is really important, of course, for battery-powered situations where you might have, where your cell phone is just sitting there, it's on, it's listening to the uh, cell tower that's closest so it can determine there's incoming phone calls, but it's essentially not doing anything. At that point, running at very low power is useful to extend your battery life. But then if you turn it on and want to do something, play a game or do something intensive, you can use the larger cores and get much higher performance. So one of the slides talks about up to 70% battery saving because of that mm -hmm. strategy? Yeah, uh, that's, the, that's the idea. Now there's two ways you can approach that. And the first approach I'm going to talk about is something that actually Grant Likely and his team, uh, Nicola Pitt and uh, David Martin are working on, which is that you treat it as one big CPU. Linux sees it as just one CPU and the fact that it's running on different transistors is invisible to the software. That's a big gold switcher. And that's something that's, uh, that they're making some great progress on. They've got some code running. They'll be getting upstream sometime later on. It's a great project. I'm working on something a little different. It's also possible to configure the hardware so the operating system actually sees all the CPUs. All right, so you've got the big set and the little set all running there. And that allows some more flexibility. For example, you can run a bunch of tasks on, say, a little CPU, and then just turn the big CPU on and off as you need it without disrupting the tasks that are running on the smaller CPU. Um, it also means that you can uh, take and figure out when you're going to need the extra bandwidth and actually schedule when you turn it on and off without having to, again, move things around as much. So, so where does that happen? Is that in, like, in the deepest level of the software? Well, um, the answer is going to change over time. If you had such a system now, you could run Linux on it, given a few hardware, you know, obviously you have to bring the hardware up and there'll be some hardware support patches required, but in terms of the core kernel, the scheduler sees CPUs, the CPUs are strange, there's little ones and big ones, the scheduler's used to different, same size of CPU, maybe running different frequencies, but it expects each CPU have the same capabilities. So, but you can, so the scheduler by itself might make some poor decisions. And we're working on making it so it gets better decisions over time. But initially, if you took a 3.4 scheduler or, a, or a, you know, an actual kernel right now, it doesn't have anything, it doesn't know about big dot little. And so it'll make decisions based on everything the same when they're not. But there are ways of dealing with that. For example, there are things called C groups and CPU sets. And uh, we had a presentation earlier uh, from uh, Chris Redpath, the guy who works at ARM, talking about how we could take and use CPU sets and take some of the CPU sets, put them on the little CPUs and others on the big CPUs, and move tasks back and forth as their computing requirements changed. Okay, so if the application understands, ooh, this piece is going to need more 
computation for the next little bit, so we'll move it to big CPU, we'll actually move it from one to another, and uh, that would constrain the schedule. The schedule's not going to inappropriately schedule it because it's pinned to those big CPUs and uh, causes the right thing to happen. It's more manual, but it works out. Another approach uh, is to leverage some of the Android functionality. There's a, a, a concept of a background task uh, in Android, and you can use that and the priority to automatically make the decision of where to move things, and thus reducing the manual thing. And again, that's another thing that Chris presented on that seems to work really well. But uh, longer term, we'd like to be more aggressive. Um, so Morton Rasmussen, uh, who's the tallest developer I've ever met, uh, worked Denmark? Uh, Denmark, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess there's a bit of an informal competition here between the Swedes and the Danes on who's, who speaks their own language the most, but uh, I'll, let them, I'll let them worry about that. Uh, so what Morton is doing is he's basing on a set of patches from Paul Turner. Paul Turner is a, uh, one of the scheduler maintainers, uh, so maintainer, uh, works at Google, and has been, we had him over at the uh, Lenaro Connect and worked out some of the things to do. He produced a patch set that does a good job of estimating how much CPU a given each thread is used over a period of time. And then the scheduler can use that, it can take that historical information to work out who needs to run on which kind of CPU. So the longer you run the software, the better it's going to be at using less power? That's the hope. That's the hope. Um, and the thing is, is that, uh, and, and then what Morton does is on top of that, he goes and, and again uses some of the Android information as well. He, he actually experimented with a number of different setups to work out what, uh, what best should run where. And the, the idea then is to have a series of things you get in the kernel to make it so that the big dot little is handled more automatically with less effort from the application of people writing it and people configuring the system over time. And again, you could take a Linux kernel today, obviously once it understands, once the hardware bring up has happened, and make that work. But these are a couple of things you could do to make it work better. The CPU hot plug is what people often use today to constrain the, the uh, scheduler. The big dot little not so much for because the, the harbor's not out yet. Let's face it, no silicon. But what they will do is they'll they'll make it so that they've got a, a, a dual core and they say right now we only want one core because you know the battery uh, lifetime is much more performance for this piece of the workload than is performance. And so they'll just remove one of the CPUs, hot pl and hot plug it, and then run on the remaining core. And that works uh, fairly well, except that hot plug has a lot of overhead. If you're going to turn it off using hot plug, it may take hundreds of milliseconds or even seconds for it to remove that from service. Uh, CPU hot plug was actually designed for removing failing hardware, not for conserving energy. So, you know, um, it's a uh, you know, usual victim of its own success sort of thing. And as a result, you have to be sure that CPU is going to stay off for quite some time. If you're going to spend maybe a second to remove it, you'd like it to be gone for 10 seconds at least. Um, and that's okay. That can happen. But what we, one of the things we're focusing on is working on reducing the overhead of CPU hot plug operations. We'd like to get it down to 5 milliseconds. At that point, you can be much more free, much more aggressive about removing CPUs from service, even if you aren't so sure they're going to be gone for a long time. It only takes five milliseconds, and if it's gone for 100 milliseconds, that still could be a win. Whereas if it's going to take a second to remove it, and you only get 100 milliseconds, that clearly was not a bad decision. So the idea then is to make uh, CPU hot plug more capable of dealing with the uh, current hardware and devices. There are some other approaches. Uh, one approach is not to actually remove the CPU, but to remove all current or future work. At present, it looks like the difficulties with that are match those of CPU hot plug, but there's a fair amount of work that can be done that actually moves both of those forward. So how many people are involved in making this work? Uh, quite a few, uh, both within Lenaro and within the community within ARM. Uh, so uh, we mentioned Paul Turner, we mentioned Morton Rasmussen, we mentioned uh, uh, Chris Redpath. Uh, Thomas Gleischer came up with a really cute trick um, for the one of the heaviest uh, overhead pieces of CPU hot plug, which is actually taking the C pure CPU threads and getting rid of them and recreating them or migrating them as needed. Uh, his observation was is that the idle threads um, have an interesting property. If the CPU goes offline, they remain rentable, but they just lay there. Nobody cares. And so if the per CPU K threads have that same property, we might just have that overhead vanish. And there's a bunch of other shortcomings in CPU hot plug. Uh, it's being used for a bunch of things, so not just power savings, but also real-time response. Remove the CPU, put it back on, and all the, all the processing is off of it. Then run your real-time application on it after doing that.
uh, and uh, obviously if you have two different applications running on the same CPU complex, which is perhaps a gutsy decision at this point, uh, you either have to do them, start them both at the same time to remove the and install the CPUs while neither is running, or you have CPU hot plug disrupting the whichever real-time application started first. So that's another motivation for making CPU hot plug run better. Uh, let's see who else. So I've been doing some stuff mostly focused on RCU to make it so it tolerates these changes in CPU hot plug. Uh, we have uh, Vincent uh, Guiteau who uh, did the measurements that uh, showed that uh, it, 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 there was some people had a knee-jerk reaction to what was expensive about CPU hot plug and it turned out to be incorrect and Nissan was the guy who figured that out and, and ran the uh, stuff to do that. Uh, Rob Lee has been working on emulating uh, big dot little systems on commodity hardware, which is a good since there isn't a big dot little silicon available at this point, uh, if uh, ways of making it so you can take a normal commodity hardware, whether it be ARM or x86 or whatever, and make it so you can have asymmetric CPUs. And Big Dot Little is an example of an asymmetric CPU. Uh, let's see, I'm, uh, there's been uh, uh, Sivat Sabat has been working on some other aspects of CPU hot plug that have been having, uh, having some problems. And I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. I'm probably forgetting several people, but I think I've rattled yeah. uh, so, enough so, names off at the moment. So last year, Big Little was announced. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a totally revolutionary idea, or is it natural evolution for ARM to go in that direction? Well, you know, I think you could take uh, any number of people and get all sorts of different answers on that. Um, I prefer to work on making it work better and uh, and uh, get it to where it works nicely with the kernels we have and, and let it do what it can do. But um, it's something I wouldn't have thought of. I think it was pretty cool. It sounds like uh, the work you're doing and the work that your your colleagues and teams are doing is quite creative, right? It's not like just straight ahead. You have to like uh, think of new directions to go, or is it just like, oh, of course we have to do this? Or how does how do you figure out what to do? It's. Uh, it's the usual open source uh, process, and uh, I'd say that there's it's it puts a lot of it a lot a lot of the kernel implicitly assumes that everything's kind of the same, and so this questions that assumption, and so there's a lot of interesting work in working out the best way to handle that. Uh, usually, the first solution that occurs to you is uh, too slow, too complex, uh, and probably doesn't really solve the problem as well as it should. So there's often a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, rework, and a lot of thinking about how to best approach it. So um, it's, it's been a lot of fun for me. So do you, do you have any time pressure to get things working before the chips come out? Or how does, uh, like, the chips are supposed to come out, like, next year maybe, or...? Well, uh, well, the thing is that some of the things we're talking about here could extend for quite some time. Uh, you got to keep in mind that a scheduler, for example, is an n-key complete problem. It's, you know, exponential complexity. Even if you have perfect knowledge of what's going to happen in the future. And the thing is, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so it's uh, something you could work on forever. So the goal here is to, is to improve things and have definite steps towards making things work better. Uh, so we'd like to get a number of things in by the end of the, end of the year, you know, things I've mentioned. Oh, and I also forgot to mention Yuri Lely, Yuri Lely, whose name I probably is totally mangled, who's working on a deadline scheduler, which may be help, very helpful for Big Dot Little and other asymmetric sorts of processes because of the fact that you can make the thing run. Uh, you, you can have a way of communicating from the application to the kernel how long it's going to take something to run and when its deadline is. Now, of course, this has been a problem for deadline scheduling is how do you know when the thing is done? How do you, how do you know how long it's going to take? And a fairly straightforward approach we use in this sort of, we're not, we're not doing academics here, we're doing, trying to get the real work is to actually measure it, right? Run the workload on the system in question. You can measure how long it takes on average, maximum, minimum, uh, quantiles, whatever makes sense, and feed that back into the process and get the data you need. Uh, but that's uh, more speculative, but uh, we're seeing some good progress on those patches and hopefully we'll get upstream soon. So the work you're doing is likely gonna be in billions of devices, or definitely gonna be in billions of devices? Well, uh, what kind of phone do you have? I have a so OMAP 4, Cortex A9. Uh, what's, what's it run? Android. Okay. Well, you want to be careful about it. It's got some of my code in there. There's your code in there. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it, and, every, and the other thousands of people have written the Linux kernel yeah. have their code in there, too. There's the Linux kernel in there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually kind of fun. I mean, I've, I come from more of a server background where uh, 
uh, in the mid-90s, I worked for a small company, and we were very happy to have several thousand installations. And that was, that was great. It was exciting. We did some really cool stuff with Parallels and some stuff I'm quite proud of. Um, but it's a different order of magnitude to be running on how many hundreds of millions or whatever number billions. of billions of, uh, well, this is smartphones, Android phones yeah. we're talking about rather than all the, yeah. all the things. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's So really all cool. Linux devices use your code? How about other devices? Well, all, all, all Linux devices 2.6 or later. If you, have a, if you have a really old 2.4 kernel, then it doesn't have my yeah. code in it. And uh, how about the competing platforms? Do they actually, because it's open source, they come and steal all the ideas? Or they, uh, it's not steal, but I mean, they, <laughs> they are free to use it if they want. Well, that's to it. get so, their stuff to work as well. So um, there's a, uh, obviously they have to respect the license. So yeah. if somebody were to take code from Linux kernel and stuff it in a proprietary platform, uh, okay. uh, that, that, that would be violating the copyright right? mm -hmm. and violating the license. Um, on the other hand, if people see what can be done and they, uh, um, you know, and they and they do it in such a way that they have the right to actually use what they're taking, then that's part of innovation and learning. I mean, Linux kernel has learned from other platforms, so why shouldn't platform other platforms mm -hmm. like Linux kernel again, assuming that you actually stay with them a lot and do what you have the right to do, as opposed to, uh, you know, for example, violating licenses and uh, other sorts of issues you might do. Microsoft and Apple doesn't yet use the Linux kernel. Um, Officially. Well, let's see. I don't know about Apple. Uh, Apple uses uh, the, the uh, iOS is based on Unix, which is um, got somewhat of a family resemblance, although I don't think it shares any code. Um, you know, you realize that Microsoft actually was in the in the top uh, 20 list of contributors to Linux kernel a release or two ago. Wow. Cool. You know why? No. Well, they want to make sure that, I mean, they, they know that Linux is used as a hypervisor. And uh, they also know that uh, Linux can run on top of a hypervisor. They want to make sure that uh, if, I think in this case, if they're being used as a hypervisor, I'd have to go back and check. Don't quote me on that. Well, I'm saying that talking to a camera, how stupid can I get? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I believe it was they wanted to make sure that uh, their Hyper-V hypervisor ran Linux really well. And so they contributed to the Linux kernel to make sure that that worked reasonably well. So. Um, you know, there they have it. I wouldn't have believed that 10 years ago, but it really did happen. So what more are you going to do here Then you now connect the next... Next three days? Uh, well, there's a bunch more big little stuff to do. We've got some uh, uh, technical steering committee meetings to work on, and I'm hoping to get a little bit of coding in too, but you never know. <laughs>